So I'd like to introduce our moderator for this session, uh, Laura Bolzano from the University of Michigan. Hi, everyone. So um, this session uh, is kind of to highlight uh, the contributions made at Rice University to digital signal processing. We've seen so far today how DSP is responsible for so many uh, technologies that have literally changed our world, and a lot of those contributions were made by people here at Rice. So I was at Rice uh, as an undergraduate student from 97 to 2001. Now um, I'm a professor at University of Michigan after also working with Rob Nowak as a PhD student at Wisconsin. And Rich asked me to tell, excuse me, tell one DSP tidbit. So um, the DSP workshop, 2000 workshop, was mentioned earlier. Um, Jeff Orsak and Don Johnson were the co-chairs of that workshop. They agreed to hosted in Hunt, Texas. And so the summer before, they hired me to create the website for submission. It was one of the first times for a conference that you could submit like in an automated way online. Okay, so that 97, that's not that long ago, right? But before that, people were still mailing in their uh, manuscripts or maybe emailing, but not no like automated things. So I set up the website. It could even compile the LaTeX and everything in the background. I was very proud of that. Then I got to attend. Um, and at that workshop, we had a, uh, a canoe. Uh, well, we, we took canoes out to a, uh, to a bonfire that Rich had invited us to. And on the way back, I was in a canoe with Jan Odegaard and, and Rob, of course, with uh, Mark Coates. And they challenged us to a race. And we can just say that one of the canoes capsized. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, first, we have Gene France, uh, formerly uh, Texas Instruments Principal Fellow. Now he's a professor of practice here at Rice University and will talk to us about DSP chips. You should at least wait until I say something before you applaud. Uh, the, the applause will be much less later on. Uh, I just want to remind you, uh, all of you professors, DSP is hardware. Not theory, not algorithms, it's hardware. And so I'm going to take some time to explain to you why the hardware was more important than all the theory you put together. <laughs> what you, no? Okay. So let me, let me start out. Uh, a, a couple of things here that are important. Uh, I spent my career at TI. Uh, Rich told me to try to make this an industry thing and take out the TI bias. I spent my career at TI, so I will have the bias. Uh, but just to keep us in sync, many of us were around for the birth of this thing called DSP. Many of us have been privileged to watch that technology grow to a point where we cannot live without it. Uh, I, I remember I had two cell phones. I got, got on the plane, I got, got on the way to the airport to fly to Dallas. I live in Houston to spend a couple of days. I realized I would, had left both cell phones next to my bed. And so I was gonna spend the next two days without cell phones. When I got to my office in Dallas, I pulled up my email, and there was an email from my wife, had no words, just a picture of two cell phones laying next to my <laughs> bed. And, and I realized we can't live without these things. The third, uh, one, two, three, four, the fourth thing uh, that I, I want to start off with is every once in a while we get the feeling that we're at the end of an era, that things are over. Uh, I, I've had that discussion with many students. And the fact is, we're at the beginning of what I see as a new era of signal processing. And I see it as more exciting than the previous one. And so uh, I, I, I'm very positive on where we're heading. But let me put some things in perspective. And, and a lot of these things have been said before, but 1948, the transistor was invented. That was 70 years ago. 1958, the integrated circuit was invented. That was 60 years ago. 1970, the microprocessor was invented. That was 50 years ago. 
1978, uh, this little, and by the way, uh, I, I was offended earlier, somebody called it a toy. <laughs> the speak and spell is a learning aid. Uh, at my tenure in TI, I would have been fired for calling it using the T word. <laughs> and so it's a learning aid. But anyway, that was the first attempt at doing a digital signal processing device. See, I don't even know why I have that. Uh, and so you look at it a different way and say, here's kind of what happened. We did that thing in 1978, that little speech synthesis chip, which was a non-programmable but a very nice uh, signal processing device. Intel the next year, do anybody remember the 2920? Yes. Okay, no, no further comment. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Amer AMI came out with a 28211. Anybody remember that? Uh, and, and then we got serious with NEC, AT&T, TI, Motorola, uh, ADI, all of us coming out with hardware. And it was fun as we started the, the business of selling DSP hardware. And that was, the fun was because it was such a huge market opportunity we could be competitors and at the same time friends. And so we, I would be at conferences over in the corner talking to my direct competitors about family. Uh, we, we knew the words we couldn't use, uh, like uh, how much are you charging? Uh, uh, but we were friends along with being competitors. So it was a, it was a lot of fun to go after that uh, and make things happen. But I really want to spend some time talking about the relationship we at Texas Instruments had with Rice University. And, and there are four things, textbooks, donations, leadership university, and a lot of TI employees who spent time as professors at, at Rice. So let me talk about textbooks. The thing we realized, uh, after the excitement subsided on how big the market could be and, and how much money we're gonna make as companies, we realized that the only people who knew how to spell DSP were some PhD students who had graduated from a handful of universities around the world. It doesn't take long to figure out that's not a big market. And so it was our desire, how do we increase the market share? Well, one of the answers was, how do we get all the practicing engineers up to speed on digital signal processing? And so we asked professors at Rice, uh, Sydney and Tom, uh, to write a couple of books. One on, uh, and you can see them up here, one on FFTs, one on digital filters. Uh, they conned another group of people. Uh, John Trackler was one of the, the people they conned to do one on adaptive uh, circuits, adaptive, adaptive filters, I'll get it. And then we realized a lot of the people out in the industry weren't going to know how to use the hardware. And so we had a couple of other professors at Rice uh, put together a couple of textbooks on how to run a lab, how, what, what's the lab manual to do that. And that's one of the things that allowed us to get started in the industry and finding a larger group of people who knew how to use the technology uh, that would buy our product. So that was one. Uh, another one we did as a company is we actually opened our pocketbooks. Now TI has never been known to be generous. Uh, in fact, a little side story and, and, and I'll, I'll rush by this. When I hired into TI, there were no rugs in the company. If you were a senior executive and you wanted to put a rug and buy it yourself, put it in your office, no, as I was told. And the idea was if you looked like you were losing money, you could get more money out of your customer. Uh, uh, now we're, we're, we're just right at the margin. We can't go any lower. And, and so that was kind of an interesting thing. Uh, but anyway, we pulled out $7 million, gave it to Rice for three things. One was to pay for a wing of uh, Duncan Hall, and we'll see that tomorrow, if you are, or, yeah, tomorrow. The second was to fund 
10 PhD students for a decade. We weren't quite sure what that meant, but it sounded like a good thing because uh, Dr. Burris kept saying that was a good thing. <laughs> and the third thing was to, to fund a visiting professor chair. And the idea of visiting professor's chair is as other professors were taking their time off uh, their sabbatical, they could come to Rice and they would be funded as a professor while they were here. <clears throat> now, the interesting thing is that visiting professor chair has now turned into two. And so Rice has these two chairs available for professors. Uh, that, that TI funded, and then once again, we had no clue what a chair meant. Uh, you know, we, we, every desk at TI had a chair and it wasn't nearly that expensive. <laughs> <clears throat> but apparently they're expensive in a university campus. But the, the thing I love about it is that as that, that amount has grown and as we have these two opportunities, it means we can, at Rice, bring in people uh, that can help us think differently and we can help them think differently. So it's really a, a, a great thing to have done. Any corporate people here, you might want to consider, I, I'm certain Rice would still take on uh, the funding of a chair. So it's okay. Go ahead and do it. We've done it and it worked. Then we had a, a, another thing we did with three universities we decided that for us as a corporation to be a leader in the hardware aspects of digital signal processing, we needed to have universities who were leading us in the theory of digital signal processing. And so we funded uh, three universities, Rice, MIT, and Georgia Tech, and all the leadership professors are here, uh, Sidney Burris, uh, Al Oppenheim, and Ron Schaefer, Although when Ron left Georgia Tech, we, we moved it over to Jim McClellan. But it allowed us to know that there was some universities around the world who were specifically looking at what is that next thing to go after that's going to need a, a new concept in hardware of which we could take on. Uh, here's a picture we took, uh, I think it was in Montreal at ICAST. Uh, where we were all together. The last thing that I, I think is interesting is the number of TI employees that have been at RISE as professors. I think I've missed one uh, that I know of. If you have any others, send me a note. I, I would love to add them and, and keep track of, uh, of those Texas Instruments people who have uh, actually been part of the RISE uh, uh, value proposition. So with that, I want to end and get us ahead of schedule. Uh, I am not a professor, so I don't work in 50-minute segments. <laughs> uh, I'm an industrialist that uh, I, the number of times I walked into a company, the senior VP sat down and said, you have five minutes. And what he was saying is, if you have bored me for five minutes, I'm leaving. And my goal was to keep them for 30 minutes, and it was pretty easy to do with the technology we had to offer. But anyway, so I don't think we're at the end of an era. I think we're at the beginning of a new era. Uh, I, I have a quote here from Al. I, I verified with Al that it, it was close enough to what he actually said to be useful. Uh, he and I exchanged uh, barbs about we've been quoting each other for years, or misquoting each other for years. So. <laughs> Uh, there will always be interesting signals. Therefore, there will always be a need for signal processing. And I think that's important for us to know. There's always going to be new interesting signals. And therefore, there is always going to need, be a need for us, both theoretically and hardware, to do new things. So with that, I want to end. Next, we have Alex Acero. Uh, Alex is Senior Director of Siri at Apple. 
And so we'll be talking about speech processing. It's great to be back here after so many years. Let me just tell you that some of the contributions that Rice did to my career in speech processing. And it starts in, uh, I got my undergraduate in Madrid, Spain, and I was doing my capstone project with this little chip called the TMS3 2010. And I was finding that fascinating. So my professors told me, you should go and get a master's. You should go to Rice. So I came here. And of course, I took not one, but two classes from Sid Burrs. <laughs> and I think one of the reasons why I passed is because this book was not printed yet, and I caught a few typos. And so well, if you catch a few typos and fix a few problems, you'll do well. <laughs> so <laughs> that was one of the books. Um, so I learned a lot about signal processing that way. I also learned some rigor in math from Ben and Azan, uh, which I wasn't as rigorous at the beginning, so that was very nice. And uh, Panos, Gene alluded to, taught me a class in speech processing that got me really interested in it. I also helped him with his book. He was doing that at that time. And something else that I was trying to reminisce, which is where we're standing at today, is where I spent a full year of my life because this used to be the graduate house. <laughs> <laughs> and I was trying to look at the dimensions, and I think I'm sitting, I'm standing where the pool was for the students, <laughs> more or less. It looked like a motel, by the way, I thought, and that's because it was a motel before then. <laughs> so I learned a lot about speech from Panos, and um, he said, well, I think you should go and get a PhD. Why don't you go to Carnegie Mellon? So that's what I did. I got my PhD there, and I started my career in speech. And I did lots of research in, uh, later on in Microsoft Research uh, in speech recognition. And back in 2009, one of the guys in my team, uh, Lee Dan, thought, OK, I've seen this paper from Jeff Hinton about um, what was going to be later called as deep learning, that I think is going to be exciting Why don't we start working on it. We invited him over uh, and build like a speech recognition system with it. We got a paper on it. It was called uh, Deep Belief Networks, because that's the term that Jeff had been using. So then we made it work on large vocabulary speech recognition, and we got like, a, I thought at, at first it was a bug, 30% reduction in error rates. And you know, we looked at it, no, it was correct. So we submitted this other paper. And when we submitted the paper, the anonymous reviewers said, wow, this is a big improvement in, in uh, word rate. By the way, you should not use DBNs because uh, it's not deep belief networks, it's dynamic Bayesian networks. That acronym is taken. Pick something else. How about deep neural networks? So I still don't know who the anonymous reviewer was, but we did. So it became deep neural networks instead. That was 2010, before AlexNet. <laughs> and then published some more papers. And if you go and look at Google Scholar uh, in quotes, Steve Neural Networks, you will see that there was like a big uptick right around that time. So it was great to be part of uh, the deep learning revolution. And that was roughly what that uh, system looked like in 2010. The spectrum time and frequency, we took like several layers and fed that to the output distributions of a hidden mark of moles. Took only a week in a GPU, that was a small system. And the error rates of this starting to decrease dramatically. This is the switchboard speech recognition benchmark. So that was like a big revolution. But deep learning that we are using so much today has deep roots in signal processing. And it's kind of, I always feel uh, sad about it. If you look at the number of attendees that go to ICASP, which is the, uh, one of the key conferences in, in uh, signal processing, it didn't change very much. Yet NIPs starting to skyrocket, so they stole some of the, the limelight. By the way, uh, uh, talking about ICAS, that also reminds me that when I was here in 1987, attended the ICAS conference in Dallas because Panos was the general chair. And he said, well, you want to come and we'll give you, I'll pay you for your registration if you come and help out in the registration desk. So I still remember being tickled when I had to leave the big heavy proceedings and hand it to Al Oppenheim. <laughs> And then the next one was Larry Rabiner. And I said, wow, oh, man, my heroes. I've learned so much in those textbooks. So that was a fun memory, too. Um, so I was in, a, for a very long time, just writing papers and doing research. And when someone asked me, one of my neighbors, so what are you doing? It's a lawyer and a doctor. Well, speech recognition. Speech what? 
So I explain what this, oh, these machines are talking, no, that's speech synthesis. Speech synthesis, like the mouth, speech recognition, like the ear. No one knew what this was really about. And when I told him what it was, he said, oh, I think I got it. The other day, my internet wasn't working, and I, talk, I called Comcast to report the outage, and I talked to a stupid machine that didn't understand me. Is that what you do? <laughs> so for many years, yes. So when someone says, what was the, uh, Rich mentioned, what was the pressing problem we're trying to solve? There was no pressing problem. That thing did not work. <laughs> but things changed when Siri came out. So after spending 20 years in a research lab, I said, well, I need to be part of the, um, of the, of the project. And that's when I moved from Microsoft to Apple to start working on Siri. And it's been an excellent drive uh, right too. You probably all know what Siri does. It's in many devices, not just the iPhone and the iPad, but the car, the watch, the HomePod, TV, uh, the Mac, and it has global reach. Let's see if we can hear this, many languages. Soy Siri, tu asistente. Eu sou a Siri, su asistente virtual. Brazilian Portuguese, speech synthesis is also an interesting technology that has benefited a lot from signal processing. Ich bin Siri, dein virtueller Assistent. German. Ja, Siri, vas virtuelle assistent. Russian. Vas Siri. Mandarin. So, in case you wonder, this is a rough block diagram of what Siri and many other uh, virtual assistants do. And there is signal processing in every single piece of them. The audio processing, automatic speech recognition, natural language processing, dialogue, uh, and TTS. And I wanted to just mention one other thing that we're doing on signal processing that is not just speech that I thought is relevant perhaps to this audience, which is, some people call it computational audio or machine hearing. Like when we're listening to an open air concert, we get audio coming from all directions. But of course, if you're in a concert hall, it start, starts bouncing off the walls. Now we're trying to replicate this with our surround system, so we put speakers in different parts of the room. And sometimes, if you buy one of these uh, receivers, it comes with a microphone was uh, uh, popularized by Odyssey, where if you put the microphone where you're si sitting and you calibrate it, maybe the sound feels more like how it was intended to be listened to. But no one uses that unless you're a, a geek like us. So uh, how about if you move the microphones, because it's kind of like a hassle you need to plug it in. How about if you move the microphones to the speakers and they are like hardwired so that you need to do that. And that's what we did with the HomePod. And it has seven tweeters, six mic um, a six microphone array, and a high excursion woofer, which by the way, normally you see it in the bottom, but it's in the top. And interestingly enough, it's because that way, it doesn't, the thing doesn't vibrate as much. And that's very good if you're trying to do linear echo cancellation, because then it's linear, <laughs> otherwise it's non-linear. Um, so what, what you do is you play some sound uh, with the speakers, you capture with the microphones the reflections, different ones, and you get impulse response. And you have seven um, speakers, six microphones, you get 42 impulse responses that you can measure. And now you can play back the signal and do filter versions for each signal where these filters are using the, they are function of some sort of the impulse response. And if you can do that, then it feels more like you're in this concert hall where you can play the sound and it bounces back and after a while, you use the walls to your advantage. And it sounds really nice. At least that's what the press tells. Um, this is what the problem is when you're trying to recognize speech and there's loud music being played. Hey Siri, what time is it? It's 6.20 PM. Not easy, you need to cancel all of that. Um, so the key thing here is Again, more signal processing. You need to do multi-channel echo cancellation, deep reverberation to try to remove some of the distortions, estimate when there's speech and when there is not, uh, reduce echo that you cannot cancel it, and background noise. Use blind source separation to uh, find there are several beams and pick the one, and detect when the person says, hey Siri, and send it to the server. So these are just a few waveforms that show how you can do this. Hey Siri, what's the weather like today? Hey Siri, what's the weather like today in Cupertino? Can barely hear that. Hey Siri, what's the weather like today in Cupertino?
It's currently clear hey, and it's in the of Culver City. So it's been a great ride and it will continue to be. When I started working on the speech, I didn't think it was a pressing need, but it was fun, as someone said this morning. And it's still fun now working in the upper levels of the processing chain with natural language processing and dialogue processing and machine learning. And I don't know if I'll be here for another 50 years, but I will enjoy however many I have. Thank you. Next we have Neil. Uh, he'll be, he's a seismic processing supervisor at ExxonMobil. So he'll be sharing with us uh, contributions in geophysics. I would admit that I'm, uh, I'm, I'm totally split in giving this talk. I am really aware that I'm standing between you and Valhalla, so I want to say nothing. <laughs> On the other hand, I'm also standing between you and Justin, who's going to go next, so I want to protect you from, uh, from Justin. <laughs> so so I'll, I'll, I'll just say something and get out of the way. Uh, of course, Rice is a special place. Uh, we all, like, you know, just, just the crowd here illustrates, uh, and, the, and, the, and the attendance at the conference here illustrates how Rice is special. Uh, I have several really special memories from Rice, like all of you. Here are a few that I've captured. Most of them revolved around Valhalla, of course. So there are also many, many memories out there, but I don't remember them because I was at Valhalla most of the time. <laughs> so, well, uh, for people who don't know me, I am uh, Ramesh Nilapani. Most people call me Nilsh. Um, I joined ExxonMobil after graduating in 2003, was working with uh, Rich as my, my, uh, my advisor, but you know, worked with Sydney, worked with, uh, with Don, with, with Rob Novak, and all the postdocs and graduate students during my time. I had a great time. Okay, but before I go any further, I thought that given the historical context required that I, that I, of, the, of the conference itself and the talk uh, that I'm supposed to give, I needed a bit of inspiration. I just didn't feel in character giving this talk. So I have to do a few things here. <laughs> Seeking inspiration from the very best. But this wasn't good enough, because I really need to go retro. So, you know, a bit of disco. And just to top it off, you know. Uh, oh, Benham, how did you do that? <laughs> so hard to be Benham. <laughs> and. Just like Benham, at least, I need to have. <laughs> so, now I kind of feel like Benham. <laughs> okay. So, let, let me jump into a few quick things and establish some common understanding here uh, about seismic data and seismic signal processing. Uh, what happens, well, the key part of seismic signal processing is to get an X-ray of the Earth, okay? It's, it's as straight and simple as that. And to do that, we, we send an acoustic source that sends out source, uh, signals to the Earth. They get reflected off the different layers of the Earth. They get recorded at the surface with receivers. We've talked about a bit uh, already, you know, for example, TI uh, made a lot of equipment uh, associated with uh, sensing these, uh, these signals. So the underlying problem here is, you know, when, once we have the source, once we have the receivers, uh, the receivers are a function of the source signal, of course, and the Earth's impulse response. Okay, so there's an underlying convolutional problem uh, in there where the Earth's impulse response is convolved with the source signature, and, and so there's always some noise, and, and you, you measure them at the surface. There is also a very complicated nonlinear problem in there even though there's a linear problem that I described, the Earth's properties are non-linearly related, related to the Earth's impulse response, okay? And these are the problems that we need to solve. Of course, there is a tremendous amount of signal associated with this, uh, with this uh, process, with this experiment that goes on. Hundreds of terabytes of data for single surveys uh, are not uncommon. So like um, Al and, uh, and, and Sydney have already pointed out the early parts of signal processing were, were really driven by, with 
the oil exploration, seismic signal processing as, a, as, an, as an application because of the uh, amount of compute required and, and of course the amount of uh, signal out there and of course as Sydney pointed out, the amount of money uh, uh, associated with the overall business. So need DSP but also you know, the, the fascinating part for me having gone from uh, DSP to the oil industry was the, the, the collaboration required between uh, physics, geology, computer science, all of that together to really understand the subsurface. Okay, so that's the problem. Uh, first, uh, you know, as, as has already been alluded in the, uh, in the previous several talks, uh, seismic exploration and DSP have been together right from the beginning. So this is a 1964 paper by Tritel and, 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 uh, and, and uh, Robinson. Uh, this was this one the best paper award in the geophysics journal okay and if you if you see even the the first sentence in the introduction it says you know uh, uh, that the use of digital computers pro process seismic recordings is now well established okay this was in 1964 and and it, like every other field out there DSP has had a critical role to play, and uh, this was one of the key, play, key papers that, that started, out, uh, uh, started out the whole evolution of DSP and, and its applications in seismic. I have to mention Al and, and, uh, uh, and, and Ron's uh, textbook. Uh, if you look at the deconvolution part or the applications part, you'll see deconvolution examples, homomorphic de deconvolution, we mentioned that, and its applications for seismic. If you look at the Wavelet Transform book by Sydney and all, you'll see denoising and compression as for seismic data being driven as, as one of the primary applications for, for uh, wavelets. And in fact, quick anecdote here, when Exxon Mobil came to Rice campus, I was going there and I was working on deconvolution using wavelets at that point in time and had no real clue about how my esoteric topic fit into the seismic industry and looked at these two books and figured out that you know, I could actually formulate the things that I was doing into applications in the seismic industry. So standard examples, and if people may remember that there was a RICE, there was a RICE consortium which was pretty uh, established during the 97 uh, uh, time frame, and all, all the majors were part of the consortium, and uh, you know, a lot of interesting and important contributions made through the consortium, influencing not only the research at that time, but also the subsequent thoughts and impacts. Okay. Uh, as you can expect, you know, there is a lot of data being acquired, so how do you acquire the data? There's a lot of signal processing that goes on in the acquisition part. Uh, there's a deconvolution talked about that, denoising, compression, you know, time frequency analysis, um, wellbore equipment design, hardware is a big part of acqu acqu acquiring data and many, many more applications. So I'll zip through this in the interest of maybe saving a few minutes. Curvelets, for example, now standard in, in, uh, in, uh, in seismic data processing. Curvelets actually turn out to be pretty well suited to represent seismic data. They, each curvelet looks like a piece of seismic reflector. Okay. So once you take the data into the curvelet domain, uh, you can surgically keep or kill your uh, specific uh, types of signals and you know, it's suited for uh, well suited for denoising. Okay. Um, so I was uh, given my exposure to rise. I was able to jump on the curvelet bandwagon and, and apply apply that to seismic along with uh, Felix Herman at, at UBC, who was also influenced by his interactions with rice on this topic. Uh, here is a quick example, you know, and you can see that one one is able to remove this, the, the noise without really impacting the signal. Uh, uh, compressed sensing is not dead yet, uh, Tom. Uh, certainly in, 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 uh, in the uh, seismic arena, there's a lot of uh, money being saved by compressed sensing. This is by uh, you know, Chuck Mosier and Chengboli. Chengboli was at Rice as a PhD student, went to ConocoPhillips. And you know, uh, this is from one of their papers where uh, the newer data was acquired much more efficiently and provided much better data, data than conventional uh, methods. Uh, in this case, about 16x sampling efficiencies, which can translate to about 2x financial returns or sometimes more. So this is tackling the linear problem of, of sensing the Earth. Uh, so it's a linear application, but there is an underlying nonlinear problem that I talked about already, right? We really need to understand the Earth's properties here. For example, the velocity with which waves propagate through the Earth. 
So there's a huge nonlinear inversion problem. So I had the opportunity to work with my colleagues and was exposed to compressive sensing, you know, talking to Justin and the, and the rest of the team here. So able to jump on that quick, uh, early on and we, we were able to do the nonlinear inversion in a uh, efficient way by doing simul using simultaneous sources. The underlying problem is huge because the computational requirements for solving problems like these, uh, we didn't have enough compute in the world at that point in time for solving a true large scale problem. Okay, so that's, the, that's the size of problems we are talking about. So, and here are a couple of examples. These were traditional so-called earth velocity models that we were, we were building. And these are more recent you know, uh, methods that we can, uh, more recent results of how much more resolution we can get in understanding the Earth. So looking out ahead, well, uh, if you look at the overall population, population is expected to go, grow by about uh, 1.7 billion. You know, our GDP is overall is expected to grow by, grow by 2x. The fact is our GDP per capita or our living standards is linearly proportional to the overall energy consumed. Okay. When people get out of poverty, they, are, they, they would use more energy. They would, they would get cell phones, they would, drive, they would be driving, they would be using you know, washing machines and so on. So it's, there's a linear, direct linear correlation between energy usage and, and living standards. And so our energy demand, even with all the efficiencies, is expected to grow by at least 25%. And the world really needs energy to, to uh, address the living standards problem and the fact is that challenge will require DSP looking ahead as well. Thank you. Next we have Aswin Sankarana Rayanan. Uh, he's an assistant professor at, at Carnegie Mellon. Um, and he'll be telling us about digital imaging. So Rich asked me to talk about digital photography and the impact it's made that, that DSP has had on it. And I took him seriously and I made a very serious talk. Um, uh, but then in the morning, he made this sort of clarion call for, you know, a call to arms to make DSP great again. Where's the cap, Rich? <laughs> right? Oh, that's good, right? So once I saw the cap, I knew I had to up my game. So this is a call to war, right? So that's the topic for today's, at least my talk, which is uh, busy war. And you'll see what it means. Okay, so what's so digital about photography? Uh, uh, sure, we are using a, sens a sensor that's digital today, right? We don't use an analog sensor, um, but there's more to this, right? Most photographs are actually more DSP than photodiodes. And by that, what I mean is um, most image, a typical image that you can get today has exactly two times more contribution, sometimes more, but two times more contribution from an algorithm, from a D typically signal processing algorithm um, than optical measurements. What am I talking about? Who wants to answer this question? Why 2x? And why 2x more algorithms and optical measurements? Raise your hand if you have an answer. Go ahead, Petros. Huh? Uh, the Bayer pattern. The Bayer pattern, thank you. I actually had a plan. Ashok was the backup if nobody would <laughs> answer it. <laughs> right, so thanks Petros, right? So this is the image that you see, right? This is the image you're seeing right now. Uh, but a camera sees this, right? Uh, kind of faded out, but if you zoom in and zoom in more, Right, and keep zooming in, this is what you end up seeing, right? Um, we can zoom in even further. So a camera sees this, right? At every pixel you get one out of the three colors, and this is called the Bayer pattern that Petros kindly answered. Um, and what algorithms then do is they hallucinate the remaining two uh, colors, right? And that gives you the image. Um, so what you see is not what the photodiode measured, you see part of it, but twice as much information is what an algorithm reconstructed um, so what you see is what an algorithm reconstructed or VZOR, right? So that's that, right? So, right, so what's Rice's role in this, right? There are many, many stories to tell here. I'm going to say a select few that sort of appeal to me, right? Uh, and of course, we can't escape wavelets. So wavelets is the heart of many of the things that we do with images, image processing, compressive sensing. Um, it, it appears in many, many different contexts. Um, and to quote Rich B, uh, the wavelet transformation provides a natural setting for developing new signal processing technique, especially for signal images that are rich in singularities, edges, ridges, and other transients, right? Um, so when we all see baby, is this snake? No, yeah. right? right? He sees the transformation, right? It's a baby, Rich, right? It's not a transformation, okay? So, 
Of course, there were other uh, contributions that came out of RISE, the RISE toolbox, the wavelet processing toolbox. How many of you used it? How many of you have told Rich that you'd rather use MATLAB than use the toolbox, right? <laughs> Me, <laughs> right? And I got into serious trouble because of that, right? So if you ever want to get Rich worked out, worked up, right, you want to get his hair standing, tell him that. Also tell him, try to get into discussion with him about what wavelets are, and then he will at some point shake his head and discuss that you know nothing about wavelets, right? <laughs> so just a personal story, I was trying to do something with compressed sensing, there was a wavelet prior, and I used a filter of length 45. And I remember Rich discussed it, he said you could actually just use a Fourier transform instead. To this date, I have not figured out whether it was a compliment, <laughs> right, or it was criticism, right. Um, but, uh, so wavelets was something big, right. Um, and Rice contributed a lot to it, um, into many things. Um, I also want to talk about imaging, with something closer to my, uh, um, something close to my own research. Um, and imaging, there are many, many different places where DSP plays a role in imaging. So what you're seeing here is an image taken from a super resolution microscope, a particular technique called structured illumination microscopy, right? So a structured illumination microscope basically deals with the following problem. You're trying to sense an image, you have to use a lens at some point, the lens has an aperture which blocks frequencies. So if you have a finite aperture, you're going to get an image that is limited in the resolution you can sense. Um, so in structural illumination microscope, you sort of overcome this limit. You go beyond the diffraction limit by shining sinusoidal patterns that does a frequency shift operator. So once you have a frequency shift operator, you can now sense, take the higher frequency, sort of move it down to the lower frequencies and you can sense them. Um, and I hope I don't have to tell you that um, a frequency shift operator has something to do with signal processing, right? Um, Similarly, a different context, super resolution microscopy again. Here you're trying to sense an image which looks like the one on the, um, um, on, on your left. Uh, unfortunately, all the thin structures are blurred out because again, your diffraction limited. Um, but using signal processing techniques, you can identify that it, uh, basically in this case, there are these probes which fire up and each of these probes when they fire up, they create a disk and you can figure out where the disks are, what the locations are, when they fired. Um, and from that you can basically get the center of those disks and that gives you this ability to go way beyond diffraction limits, like an order of magnitude, right. Um, in a different context, again imaging, but imaging for healthcare, um, there is an entire sub-discipline of um, uh, medical imaging that's called photoacoustic tomography, um, where you fire lasers into the, um, into the skin and then you sort of heat up tissue, the tissue emits ultrasound, you image ultrasound and then using signal processing techniques, you recover the image back, right? And this is something that's uh, close to um, the Rice family because um, the work, pioneering work done in photoacoustic uh, tomography uh, is one of the pioneers there is, uh, is a Rice PhD alum, uh, Li Hong Wang, who's currently at um, Caltech. Uh, more recent work in this space from the Rice Scalable Health team has led to many different interesting ideas that look at um, blood oxygenation level, how to monitor it, in this case, monitoring perfusion from the pulse scan. If you don't know about this, I highly encourage you to go to their website. It should be easy enough to find it. Um, and there are many, many interesting aspects of this project of how uh, signal processing, how engineering of various sorts uh, plays a role in um, you know, health monitoring in a scalable way. No story would be complete without this, right? Um, Mark already had a very nice discussion about this. I'm not going to say much, except, uh, but for those of us who sort of graduated around, no, I graduated in 2008, 2009, um, and I read the compressed sensing papers, the early papers when I was a PhD student, uh, and being a computer vision person, this particular paper appealed to me because it really connected the dots in how uh, imaging, right, and compressed sensing uh, could be very neatly tied together. And in many ways, this was, uh, this became a very integral part of um, computational photography, what, which became much popular, which became popular uh, in the years to come, right, uh, after this paper. And, um, this is sort of the work that uh, Kevin, where's Kevin, Kevin's there, Rich, and all the students here, and postdocs that we did, um, this gave us a sort of a tangible piece of equipment that we could collect measurements with, right? And yes, every time we gave a talk, we had to defend this device, right? Uh, but that was fine, because it was something, right? It was not just uh, theory and algorithms for algorithms sake, we had something tangible that we could work with, and that's why this was special. Um, and that's why we still see this sort of this diagram being used all over the place, right? Um, and then when you take this idea to the limit, right, you no longer sense images. And the single pixel camera was, a, was one of the examples of this. You're, not, you're no longer sensing images. 
you are making some measurements and then computationally reconstructing it using priors, using signal processing techniques. Um, and one recent work, again from Bryce, uh, this is Rich and Ashok's work, um, is this uh, flat cam, right? a lensless imaging technique um, where the measurements you make look like this, right? And computationally, you pull out uh, an image like that or a video of the four and four, right? Um, and now, basically, we have come full circle to where we started, right? What you're seeing is what an algorithm reconstructed, right? Otherwise, you would get uh, these measurements, right? And of course, this field is now called um, computational imaging, which is really the um, intersection of computation, algorithms, signal processing techniques, um, but to sense, okay? Um, or as I like to call it, VisiWar, okay? <laughs> so I'll stop here, but um, uh, as it just so happened while I was thinking about the, you know, uh, the role that DSP, uh, Rice DSP played in the grand scheme of things, I realized I'm just too young to talk about it. I was born in the 80s. Uh, I probably learned about F15 early 2000s, right? I just felt too young, too um, unequipped to talk about it. As it so happened, a good friend of many of you, many of all of you, um, was at Carnegie Mellon yesterday, and um, this is Louis Schaff from Colorado State, and he sends his regards. He also, uh, I also had a long chat about, uh, with him about Rice, DSP, uh, the work that was done in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, um, and sort of the highlights of it. I don't, I'm not going to talk about it much here because it's been talked about in detail today, uh, but it was clear that it was special, right? Um, and with that, I'll, uh, I'll stop here. Um, congrats, DSP. Yeah. We have Justin Romberg. Justin is the Schlumberger Professor of Electrical Engineering or Electrical and Computer Engineering at Georgia Tech. Um, he'll be talking about the variety of arrays that, a variety of areas that have been impacted by the concept <laughs> of sparsity. Uh, I, you know, I was just sitting there thinking. So, I've, I, you know, I was a, a, a PhD student at Rice for six years, and I was a postdoc at Caltech for almost three years, and now I've been on the faculty at Georgia Tech for almost 13 years, and I've given you know, my fair share of talks uh, in, in my day. But I think the first research talk I ever gave was almost exactly 20 years ago to the day, and it was an amazing intersection with this audience. So I was actually telling Al Oppenheim and Ron Schaefer this as we went to lunch. So I was fortunate enough to be a TI fellow, and you know, we went up to Dallas. Rich wanted me to talk about some stuff I was doing uh, uh, for my master's thesis, and I was incredibly nervous because it was my first talk, and Al Oppenheim was going to be there, and Ron Schaefer, and Jim McClellan, and, Ru and Russ Mercer, and all these things. So I mean, here we are again for possibly my 350th talk, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Okay, so uh, somehow I got stuck with the math talk. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about application area, but rather I'm talk about this idea of sparsity, which is kind of like, you know, it's a mathematical concept, but it's kind of like a, a unifier for a unifying model for a lot of the work that's gone on sort of in the second half of this 50 years of digital signal processing. Uh, and we've actually heard a lot about it already. Things like wavelets and compressed sensing are, are, are sort of key to this story. Okay, so lucky for you, this talk's only 10 minutes. I'm not going to blast you away with, with harmonic analysis estimates, but we do have just a few equations. Uh, so, I mean, sorry, I guess the, the, the story with sparsity, I mean, it starts with kind of the most familiar thing to, to, to someone at signal processing, this idea of a, a linear superposition, right? So, I guess a sort of a fundamental model that we have is we build the signal up out of some kind of fixed building blocks, these, these psi i of t. Uh, and, um, you know, it, it, this is, again, very familiar even to undergraduate, uh, especially when these psi IoT are sinusoids, right? Like one of the first things we learn in signal processing is how you take apart a signal and put it back together uh, in terms of sinusoids. Like also classically, you can play similar tricks uh, uh, using splines, right? And, and in the end, you know, what this is, this is kind of like generalized notion of, of discretization. Right? I have this continuous time signal. I want to turn it into a list of numbers. Maybe those list of numbers are samples. Maybe they're Fourier coefficients, et cetera. But at the end of the day, I have this list of numbers. And also at the end of the day, this is some kind of approximation, right? And so what I want to do is I want to have this be a good approximation. I'd like to have it be as good an approximation with as short a list of numbers as possible. Uh, and, you know, classically, like, you know, way before I even was probably walking, people sort of had this this realization that, okay, we know when I use a representation like this, kind of its accuracy, it depends on the smoothness of the signal. That was kind of the, you know, uh, like up until maybe the late 80s, that was, that, that was kind of, you know, what we learned from, from mathematical harmonic analysis. Okay, uh, 
So here's kind of the problem with that. It's sort of a well-known story. So what I have on the left here uh, is just that, you know, this is just me messing around in MATLAB on the plane yesterday. So here's a smooth signal. Here's its Fourier coefficients on a log scale. So that's like one up there, and it's like 10 to the minus 8 down here. It decays quickly. All right, now what does that mean? It means we can build up the signals with a small number of sinusoids and still get something which is uh, very closely approximated. Okay, now, if you do something seemingly benign, again, this will be familiar to a lot of you, just rip the signal, right, to introduce a discontinuity. Uh, the Fourier transform is no longer your friend. It no longer gives you this tight approximation, right? So the coefficients fall much more slowly. And that means I'm going to need many more to get some kind of accurate representation for what's going on, right? And so this was, you know, this is, again, well known. Ever since it started, people tried to, like, build up square waves out of sinusoids on, on their oscilloscopes. But, uh, you know, we've, we've seen several times already the, um, a, you know, very nice, uh, approach to dealing with signals that sort of emerged in, uh, let's say, the late 80s and the early 90s with the, the uh, you know, the work in the mathematics community of Ingrid Dobichet and uh, Stefan Malat and, and Yves Meyer, and then also in the signal processing community with like, people like uh, uh, Tom Parks and Mark Smith who were working on filter banks. Uh, but, you know, if we, we think of it as just, a, you know, as a type of Fourier representation or a type of basis expansion, Right? Uh, you know, what we're doing is we're using the same type of equation, building up the signal out of a superposition of things. Now the things are sort of local and they, they treat smooth uh, regions in a nice way. So what you get is now when you have smooth signals, uh, just, the, the, you know, the, when you have discontinuities, it still affects your basis coefficients, but it affects a much smaller number of them. Right? But now the story's changed just a little bit because, like, which coefficients you need to use changes, and it depends where the edges are, right? So, so kind of the model here changes from building up a, a, a signal out of a fixed library of functions to uh, saying, I have this bigger library, I'm just going to choose a small number of, of, of elements from it. Okay, and so you can see there's some kind of like adaptation here, right? So that's kind of, you might think of as adaptive superposition. Are you still taking the same idea of a linear superposition, just which elements I'm choosing depend on the signal itself. So you really do have a simple and it's straightforward, easy to, um, easy to motivate model, but you know, it is nonlinear now. So it's a, a nonlinear, and we'll see that this type of nonlinearity really can uh, be quite powerful. Okay, so that's, when we say sparsity, this is the kind of thing we mean, right? So like, you know, we've seen a bunch of pictures like this already. Uh, here are different it, images we used to use in graduate school. I mean, we still see these in papers all the time. Uh, and here are subbands of their, their wave of coefficients. And, you know, like I said before, they, you know, on the top, the energy is, of course, spread all over the image. On the bottom, it's compacted onto this small set. So you really have a parsimonious uh, representation of what's going on. So this is, this is what we mean by sparsity. So it has kind of like obvious implications. Uh, oh, right. So before we get to the result, I have to, you know, show this is, uh, you know, I spent maybe a year of graduate school trying to understand classical harmonic analysis literature, so now I have to tell it to you. But uh, uh, so, like, you know, we, uh, we, we, you know, we, you sort of say, okay, this is great when we look at it like this. Okay, great, makes sense. Like wavelets, they adapt the edges and concentrates. What can you actually say from an analytical perspective? So again, the very classical result is if you have a signal uh, that the smoother it gets, the faster its Fourier coefficients fall off. That's a great qualitative statement. The way you kind of like codify that, understand that analytically, is like, okay, so I have D derivatives, right? Then the signal Fourier coefficient is a signal that falls off like N to the minus D. So kind of the smoother your, you are, the more derivatives you have, the faster your Fourier coefficients decay, and the more, the, the more accurate you can build up your, your, uh, uh, your signals. Okay, so then we, know we saw we, when we ripped the signal, we introduced these discontinuities. It was smooth, except for uh, uh, at a couple places, um, then you take first then Fourier coefficient no longer works, and it doesn't really matter how smooth it is, it's always just it is slow decay, n to the minus one. Okay, but now, you know, when we look at wavelets, and we, instead of choosing the same set of wavelets every time, we take the n largest, right, we actually recover a rate that, uh, uh, the same as smooth signal. So this, this adaptivity uh, happens automatically with the wavelet, so we can describe it uh, in, in, in mathematics, and you know, you don't, of course, you know, you, you get, in, uh, introducing discontinuities gives you some uh, 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 increase in your expansion coefficient, but it's on the same order. It's qualitatively the same. It's just where your coefficient is a smooth signal. So if you think about things in math, like these, these would be the three things I, I, I would say. Okay, so now let me just segue for a second here and say like, you know, when I was in graduate school, we had this sort of, uh, this sort of challenge that different research groups were attacking in different ways. 
And that is, you know, this story of like piecewise singularities. It doesn't quite, it's not quite the same in two dimensions, right? Because if I look at a piece of an image, right? Uh, the, see, there are, of course, singularities, that's the motivation for it, but they lie along smooth contours, right? And that's a, actually a qualitatively different type of structure. So there is a race to figure out, okay, wavelets are great for, for local singularities. What are we going to use for, for singularities along a curve? And so there you have almost this self-parity of names coming out. So we have wavelets, curvelets, you already heard about, contourlets, shearlets, bandolets, et cetera, right? So everyone had their own approach for like sort of taking a, a advantage of the geometry of images jointly with this uh, uh, kind of local singularities. Okay, so uh, what's even, so now looking back on this, like 15 years later, uh, you know, before any of that, there was this sort of a machine learning experiment done by Olshausen and Field where they just said, well, I'm not gonna like try to come up with some mathematical model. I'm just gonna take a bunch of image patches and learn what a sparse representation should be. And I mean, they kind of get wavelets, right? So I don't even know <laughs> what we're doing here, except in geo. <laughs> okay, so, but anyway, so you know, once you have this, this sparse, sparse representation, the, the uh, representation in place, kind of the implications are pretty clear for, for some applications. So for compression, it's very easy to visualize, okay, why using fewer coefficients helps you. There's fewer things that I have to code. Right? You have to keep track of them in a little more careful way. Uh, but you, know, you have like, say this, you know, JPEG itself is almost doing wavelets. It's breaking up into sort of local Fourier spots. JPEG 2000 is definitely doing wavelets and very explicitly keeping, you know, keeping track of these, uh, uh, the structure of, of how the sparse coefficients occur. And you know, you've, for images that look about the same, maybe you get a factor of three change in file size, right? So JPEG 2000, I guess, it is ne never became as widespread as JPEG, but it's still sort of an important technology uh, uh, for like, professional distribution of films. Okay, uh, other things. So two minutes, okay, good. So other things, denoising, we'll skip that. We'll say that the one great thing is the sparsity, you know, what uh, you know, most of my career has been spent thinking about is sparsity makes uh, also signals easier to acquire, right? And so we had a, a sort of abstract results in linear algebra that say, okay, look, if I have a y equals phi x and the phi is underdetermined, right? We think of phi as being some linear model for our acquisition system. This thing is being maybe basis coefficients for some signal I'm interested in, and the y being the data we read off the sensor. Uh, you know, you, 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 you can invert this in general, but if the signal's sparse and this, this matrix phi obeys certain properties, then you can, right? And kind of the key uh, uh, equation that came out of that is like sort of the number of rows you need doesn't really look like the resolution that you want to achieve or the bandwidth that you want to achieve but it rather it grows like the, the number of active things, the sparsity of the, the vector that's there. Okay, so we already heard a little bit about the, the, the impact of, of compressed sensing, but like, you know, when you say something about y equals phi x, you're saying something about a lot of different kinds of acquisition systems, right? These all each have their own specialized fields attached to them, but, uh, but in the end, I mean, with a little bit of hubris, it'd say it's all, all y equals phi x. Okay, so, uh, in the end, like you know, we've already mentioned impact in, in uh, 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 medical imaging. This, the, these ideas that you're, the thing that you're after, a sparse structure, uh, sort of changed the way uh, people thought about uh, 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 running MRI machines. Uh, it also changed the way people thought about microscopy. When we just haul from Ashwin, we spread the beam, do a little coated illumination. You're co you can reduce scan times by combining pixels together and then detangling them by, by uh, uh, looking for signals that are sparse, treating it as one of these acquisition problems. And we just also heard from Neil, which like, just makes a big difference in seismic imaging where sort of there is a definite cost associated with either every measure, every sensor that you put down or every time you have to run a forward wave solve on your, on your giant computer. Okay, so now uh, if you'll allow me just 30 seconds to reflect, it's like, you know, like what do we really take away from all this? Like I can't remember all the different results. Like I even had to look up the end of the minus D stuff I showed you earlier just to refresh exactly what it is. Right? So, so what like qualitative lessons do we have like going forward from this, this sort of 25 years of work? So I see the first thing is like sinusoids are not the only thing we can use to decompose signals, right? So look, like that, that's I think something that was sort of well known uh, even before the 80s. But I don't think it was like mainstream until like ever started talking about waveless, waveless, okay, what is waveless? It's like Fourier, except you're, you know, you're just using different bases, right? So I think that's one of the, the in broader impacts that, 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 that uh, the work on waveless had on the, uh, uh, the community at large. 
Another thing, you know, when we, we talk, we talk about this, so simple nonlinear models can be powerful. It doesn't kill, you usually think of nonlinear as being a nuisance, right? So nonlinear models, they can do uh, very powerful things that linear models can't do. And we're seeing that again now we're using these like deep generative networks in deep learning. Okay, then finally, uh, especially for compressed sensing, like what is a good takeaway? Uh, you know, you have all these ideas of sparsity and randomness, et cetera. But really, like, I think one of the most powerful messages is if you recast DSP problems in terms of linear algebra or functional analysis, it opens new, many new avenues for you, right? In particular, like, you know, when I was in graduate school, none of us knew anything about optimization, right? Now everyone taking DSP, you know, knows about optimization just because we're, have, we're very good now at setting up problems in the language where we can apply these other great tools from numerical analysis. So Sydney, that's something Sydney was talking about earlier too. Okay, so with that I'll finish and thank you. <clears throat>